Welcome, everybody. We are on the uh, final Car PGA virtual panel stream, which we're very excited about. Very excited about my guest today. Um, but we have some housekeeping before we uh, start. My name is Mike Tresca. I'm your host and your chair for our Car PGA uh, virtual panels. And we do these. Uh, we've been doing them successfully. We had said uh, one of our goals was to get over eight. We actually are with this one achieving nine. So we achieved that milestone. Um, we also now, the YouTube channel has uh, gotten popular enough that we have our own handle, which YouTube provided. Um, and uh, so we're doing really well. And I'm, I'm very excited to close out the year uh, with everything that's been going on in terms of our goals and also all the challenges, obviously, that we've been facing um, through the pandemic and, and uh, in gaming in general. So we're doing great. Um, but we are going to close out the year strong and start the 2023 with a few things. Um, one of them you will see for sure is the annual report. So look for that. That's coming in hopefully January, where we will have the annual report with the board members chiming in to um, give a uh, inventory of all our members, as well as sort of our goals and how we both performed against those goals of this past year and our goals for 2023. I'll tell you, uh, generally speaking, we're doing pretty good. Um, and so that's a sneak preview, but hopefully we'll do better uh, in the coming year. We also are having a board member vote. So that is making sure board members um, absolutely are voted in. Uh, one of the things that can happen very simply is that if you don't vote, then we sort of inertia continues us along. But I consider the health of the organization to be uh, by engagement of voting. And I'll tell you right now, we have not seen that engagement to date. So I'm hoping as our membership grows, we will continue to see that increase. So we will get those votes. So that was another thing you'll see. So in addition to the uh, annual report, you'll see our request for votes as well. And overall, uh, it's just been a privilege to be the chair. I really appreciate all your support um, and doing channels like this, which is very exciting. Uh, I'm thrilled to be able to do it. I think it was a great idea. This is actually the board's idea was my idea. Um, so I'm, I love it. I think it's a great uh, thing. And I, I think whether or not I get voted into chair next year, um, I hope we continue it. So uh, very excited, but all that will be in the annual report, which you can read later. So I won't go over it. Um, so with that out of the way, I'm going to turn our attention to Adam of game to grow Hello, Adam. Welcome. Hello. Thanks for having you've been, me. You've been very patient while I talk about other stuff without you on screen. Let's see if we can get you on the screen. I know I can get you in here somewhere. Um, there we go. We'll just do that. Okay. Um, so uh, welcome to the Car PGA. We obviously, you sort of got, a, a just before we started, a little bit of an overview. Could you tell us a little bit about, we always start with the easiest thing. Well, it's not easy. Um, <laughs> you know, what's your sort of game? How did you get into gaming? Like basically what was that? And then we'll take it from there. Um, let's see. I, I, gaming in general, I think I've always been a gamer. I'm, I'm, a, I'm one of the geriatric millennials that grew up with video games. <laughs> um, but I got into tabletop games. Um, I had sort of a classic tale of, uh, I, I was taught by my older brother. Um, and I grew up in a small town in South Texas where I learned at Boy Scout camp um, how to play Dungeons and Dragons. And it wasn't a tabletop role playing game, it was a cop top role playing game. So we were playing in a tent. And it was uh, the early 90s, and the satanic panic lasted a little bit longer in South Texas. So it was well into the 90s. So I, my first time playing Dungeons & Dragons, I think the scoutmaster came over and shook the tent and told us to stop doing that devil stuff. <laughs> um, it was, it was uh, right around the early time of Magic the Gathering as well. So we got a little bit of that speculation from the the leadership of the scout team that we shouldn't be playing these games. So, of course... I was, I was hooked. Right, of course. You know, it's really funny. So it's funny you bring this up. So I'm Scoutmaster of my troop currently, uh, and I've taught the Game Design Merit Badge, and I've also <laughs> run D&D games at camp, and it and at summer camp specifically. And it's so fascinating because, to your point, I always expect someone to come in and be like, stop that right now. Like, you know, <laughs> what is that weird stuff that you're scaring our children about? But, of course, all of them, like when I, the last game we did, the kids were like, oh yeah, I'm in the other kids campaign. Like they literally were like, oh, we've already played d, &D. Um, And then the parents were there and were like, oh, that's fun. Oh, like um, Stranger Things. And it was just so funny because to your point, like if you just took that and moved it forward in time, what a difference. Um, oh, times have changed great. quite a bit since, yeah. Yeah, since the early nineties and mostly in a good way. Wow. So you learned, so you, so now you're hooked, right? 
Um, did you continue to game as an adult or how did that, how did that continue? So, you know, I, I, like I said, I was in a small town in South Texas and there wasn't a lot to do in my small town. And so we, pretty much the mall, it was very stranger things in that way. Mm -hmm. um, we went to the mall and hung out at the mall. So I hung out at the bookshop and the game store, and that's really how I found my people. Right. And so I, I really used games to sort of help me find my community because I could be in the game section of the bookstore at the mall and look through the Encyclopedia Magica and then see someone else looking at the Wizard magazine across the <laughs> store and you kind of found your people, right? That was sort of how I how I used games at a, as a young age. And then as I got a little older, middle school was tough for me. I was I was like a lot of kids in middle school, I was bullied a bit. Mm -hmm. And so I really sought refuge in my stories and in my books and in my games and things like that. And really like leveraged D and D um, at the time, I think I was playing second edition probably. And I was, I was really leveraging those games as a way to escape the world that I was in in middle school, very unforgiving place that I was in in middle school. And, but in my, my characters I could play, right. The stories I was creating with my friends, I was a hero. I was, confident and charismatic i was saving the world on a regular basis and that's kind of how i when, when i look back at how my gaming journey has been and what i do with games now it all kind of comes back to that place right that i wasn't confident with who i was and my my social community but through my games and through the stories that i was building i was actually able to learn more about myself learn to build that sense of confidence and then that has really been the through line my my um that was when i was playing the games the most right i was like drawing dragon lance logos on my binder right i was fully into it um and then I, it was actually a, a renaissance again sort of after i graduated from college when i was uh, developing my career as a drama therapist and then really realizing that drama therapy being you know the intentional use of drama games and activities for inside growth and change well D, &D tabletop role-playing games really are a drama game and activity that can be overlaid with drama therapy and now we've got therapeutic role-playing games so that was my my journey from a boy scout camp satanic <laughs> panic all the way to a you know therapeutic game master today that's uh, that's amazing and 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 uh, it's so wonderful to hear these you know happy endings i guess i mean there's not it's not an ending <laughs> was that the last unicorn they're like there's no happy endings nothing ever ends but you know the point being that to turn um certainly the travails of trying to get there into something positive that you know continues to this day not something you leave in your past and you're like well that was cute i mean there are certainly people like that um who i think think you know well that was nice but i don't do that anymore but to hear obviously that it's still relevant uh and in new ways right um in your life i think is especially if it was a positive experience as you said it was i i, I had very similar uh circumstances almost exactly tracking which you know we're not alone right which was definitely <laughs> being bullied definitely seeing dnd &D as sort of a almost parallel universe that you could use as sort of a safe space. Um, certainly socially attracted people who were very much feeling the same. Um, and that continued all the way through, you know, up to and through college. One of the things that um, it doesn't get a lot of mention was they said, you know, the two huge times you game is, you know, there's a couple ingredients. You can't go anywhere, right? So you're stuck usually. <laughs> so you don't have a lot of transportation. You probably don't have a lot of money. And you have a lot of time to your point you mentioned having time <laughs> and the two times that that you can do a decent campaign usually four years is high school and college <laughs> because you can't sure. go any right you got friends you got resources you don't have a lot of money so you're sort of together by the way the other group which you don't hear is prison <laughs> it's actually <laughs> another group who's sort of in that category that's a whole nother conversation yeah but um yeah i mean that absolutely tracks so that's i love to hear that stuff so so now I you know I obviously I've looked at the Game to Grow website and talking about how you you sort of have a partner. Um, so uh, obviously you have this great idea of sort of this therapeutic you know um, concept. So how does Game to Grow come out of this? So uh, the origin story of Game to Grow began actually with a small. So Game to Grow is a is a, no, a nonprofit organization, but it actually started. The, our origin story goes back a decade. Uh, before Game to Grow existed, we were a small two person organization called Wheelhouse Workshop, and we were uh, a little little tiny startup. Myself and Adam Johns, uh, who I met in grad school, and the mm -hmm. two of us were 
uh, thick as thieves uh, in grad school. We just learned, you know, both Adams, both we brought dice to a class where we were supposed to talk about our like personal culture and maybe we connected. Um, so then um, we were we were working in an after school program that was really designed for kids who needed that extra la layer of social support. And it was a it was an RPG program and it wasn't in it wasn't facilitated by a professional. It was just kind of we were we were hired to kind of keep the, you know, keep the guardrails up a little bit for these kids who are playing D&D. And then that was when it clicked, right? What I was saying earlier about being in grad school and saying, oh, actually, I think this is, we could do something with this. This is something And if we were to design our in-game encounters intentionally and build a little bit of the improv skills into this, the social relational work, we could actually use this really intentionally for this population that has identified that they want some support building friendships. So Adam and I sort of clicked realized we could do more with with what we had seen and so we started Bill House Workshop we ran that for a few years uh, we had like 30 clients in the greater Seattle area um, who were coming to our groups to play tabletop role-playing games and then we were we kind of hit a threshold I was a full-time classroom teacher teaching in fourth grade literacy and Adam Johns was a full-time therapist in private practice and we were like just we can't we can't take this on full-time unless we sort of step off the cliff a little bit and step into the unknown. So we started Game to Grow as a nonprofit. And then from there on, we just kind of took off and we have hired a bunch of staff. Um, and now we have a, a, a pretty large um, nonprofit organization with an international reach. The, the, the core belief behind Game to Grow is that games have the power to improve people's lives. That, that power is increased if we play that those games with an intention to make our lives better and that that power can be even greater if it's the game is facilitated by a trained professional so our, our vision really is a game in every school a game in every home a game in every hospital a game in every clinic so we really want the games with intention that's amazing now you um and it's funny because I, I saw this and I think we probably covered it on uh N world but you 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 launched with with a crowdfunding uh, in, initially, right? Was that, did that help Game to Grow launch? So we we had, uh, it was, you know, we didn't have a, any money, right? The, I like <laughs> to say we started, we started with literally the dice that we had and we didn't have a full set of dice. So we literally started with, I didn't have enough money for a D8 or D4. So I had a D8 and I was like, the kids can figure out, do the math. We They can figure out what a D4 is with a D8. That's literally how we started when we when we launched originally. So we used the crowd funder. Uh, you know, we didn't have a team behind us. I was, I was our video editor. So now I'm very grateful for video editors because that took me like 60 hours to put together a minute of video um but uh we, we launched with a crowd funder and then we we um actually got a, a foundational grant from child's play charity to really kick us out of the oh, gate wow. a little bit so we we went from a two-person organization to a, to a pretty large organization with an office space pretty quickly um considering we had full-time other gigs moonlighting <laughs> on this work and then becoming full-time you know executives that's awesome. And, and obviously, so, I mean, I, that worked, obviously, and I think it hopefully showed you there was a need and an interest uh, in, in, you know, from people are presumably around the world, but, you know, in terms of how you were um, the, the crowdfunding supporters, which is fantastic. One of the things that the site talks about when you talk about Game to Grow is how you've had a pivot in the pandemic, because that clearly is, well, there's a lot of problems <laughs> that comes with it, some of them being a very social platform that where the pandemic is it, by its nature, uh, the opposite of that, I guess, what's one, one of the things we talked about a lot at CarPGA was what guidance do you give people um, when the very definition of the thing we love to do is potentially dangerous in some way, shape or form, you know, physically, not hopefully not, not mentally, emotionally, but um, w was a real concern because a lot of the things that they always say don't gather in groups was, of course, that was one of the things that we do. Don't laugh and talk around a table. Okay, well, guess what? You know, um, so clearly that's that's was a challenge. And it sounds like um, you, uh, Game to Grow was able to pivot during that. But, you know, and I don't want to lose sight of this. There's also clearly stressors that came about from that. But let's start first with how to Game to Grow pivot um, during the pandemic. So if we all remember like March of 2020, when we were shutting down for two weeks, 
Remember I've that two that weeks? Out. I blocked it <laughs> when out. We were gonna yes. shut down. <laughs> yeah. um, there was there was a time when we thought this would be a thing we could all just kind of go home, eat pasta for two weeks, and we'd be able to come back from it, right? right. So around that time, we were really worried. We we were um, we took we canceled a bunch of our groups, and a lot of our participants, you know, just didn't come to groups those weeks. We had some groups that continued because we had groups that really, really wanted to continue to meet. And then eventually, because of the advisories, we had to cancel our groups. Right. And then that two weeks became four weeks. And then we continued to be in this space where we realized it wasn't going to be just eat some spam and stay home and it'll go, it'll go away. And so we transitioned to our groups to virtual. So we got on Zoom. Basically, I got all my staff Zoom accounts and then invited the participants to join via Zoom. And to be perfectly honest with you, I was worried. I was really worried about what it was going to be like. Um, I'm like I said, I'm trained as a drama therapist, so I'm I'm not good at being stuck in a small box. Yeah. Um, I, I like to stand <laughs> up. I like to move my body. I, I really like the embodiment of of the of the game. But I was really um, pleasantly surprised with how well our groups transitioned into a virtual space. Like. Um, I didn't have to apologize for a program at all. All the, in fact, the parents that were working with us wrote us emails to say, wow, thank you so much for the continuity of services. My child is already very socially isolated. They're already very, have a, a sense of loneliness and lack of community. So when the rest of community goes away, this being able to continue has been a lifesaver. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, with that, we realized that we have people we could serve that we haven't been able to that now we can um we were only serving people in tacoma seattle bellevue kirkland just right around the seattle greater seattle area but we've had people join our waiting list for years in other parts of the country and other parts of the world just kind of hoping oh if you ever open a a group over here in san francisco i'd really love to join you or in idaho or wherever and we had no plans of ever opening a brick and mortar in the East Coast anywhere, but once we were virtual, geography was no longer a barrier and we could have people join our groups. And now we have people, because we don't have any limitations to where we can serve, we've got all over the United States, we've got people in um, Europe, Australia, parts of Asia who are able to join virtually wow. and play tabletop role-playing games. I mean, I mentioned earlier, I'm a geriatric millennial and we had pen pals when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, and you had to wait a few weeks before you got your letter back. And I remember I had a pen pal in Chicago. And I was like, I can't imagine what life is like in Chicago. <laughs> um, but now our players get to get to <laughs> play RPGs with someone in another part of the world. And it's so much better to build community and understanding of different people across not just time zones, but you know, cultural regions. So now we have people playing across the world and in the story, they're you know in an adventuring team working together. So it's a really cool expansion of what we've been able to do in the pandemic. That's amazing. Yeah, and you know, I think certainly a lot of people were tested in terms of what a what virtual they were comfortable with, b what the virtual platforms could actually handle, which <laughs> they figured it out. But we did definitely discover there were limitations. I think some of those are less than they were, but there's still a couple things you know bandwidth. Uh, audio, video, lighting, all that stuff that we're all probably very accustomed to now. But it used to be only people who were professionals, either streamers or on TV, cared about, right? So now we're mm -hmm. <laughs> certainly that's my whole job, um, <laughs> which is sort of fascinating, right? So those are things that skills you wouldn't have thought you'd need. But, um, you know, to your point, it also expanded this massive universe of, of gaming. Certainly my gaming group is all virtual um and probably couldn't be done any other way because of the parents and the busy schedules and and sort of how we are able to manage things it's way easier to just sit down turn the computer on game and then immediately get up or frankly pause it if i need to say guys i just have to step away and deal with a kid um or deal with some other circumstance which is is massive um i think that's that's amazing uh the thing that has come out of it which took us by surprise so just two examples Boy Scouts, we took it online uh, virtually, just like you said. So um, that was massive because it helped us retain. What we didn't know was that there were troops not doing that. And what we discovered is most volunteers type of stuff. So that's your sport. That's your Boy Scouts. Lost 70% of their membership during the pandemic. Wow. Like a devastating number. Um, the other thing was my kids are in uh, Taekwondo and the dojo did everything virtual. So we basically turned our gym into like supporting that 
and the masters were able to, you know, now if there was no way it was the same, right? There's just no way you can accurately assess at the speed of, you know, clipped video. But to your point, continuity was the biggest piece. So when they went right back in to when the everything opened and it was a year later, it wasn't, as you said, like we were hoping we could just eat our spam and go back. Um, they were able to go right back when we got back. So my, and my kids didn't, like we went, as soon as they were able to go to school, we sent them to school. What was astonishing to us is, and th this goes on now, this is not, you know, like right after the pandemic, it sort of loosened its grip a little bit, not that it's over by any means. Um, but one of the things that uh, my daughter experienced was a very sort of rough talking to from all the teachers and all the administrative staff who essentially were like, you have to come into school. And what we found out was apparently there have been, I mean, and I'm sure you're familiar with this. You have the sort of the casual ties and the strong ties. And some people have casual ties with ac academics in school. And if the parents are not proactively pushing these kids to go, there's a feeling that they can make it up or, or whatever in some virtual way, because we now know you can, right? You, mm -hmm. the, the, the mask has been pulled back. Um, but one of the things that had came up quite a bit, so that was one thing, it was the attendance. But the other thing that came up that the, the teachers said to us was post-pandemic, they are not seeing the um, emotional skills they would expect of kids where they should be. Hmm. Uh, and and we were, it's so funny because, you know, of course, my wife and I always poke at this stuff. We're not like just, oh, oh well, boy, that sounds, but we were like, well, I want to, what do you mean? And they said, what that essentially means is they do not know how to work as a group in person. Um, they're very anxious about speaking up. Um, so things that th I think teachers probably took for granted that, you know, some kid would raise their hand. Now they said they face deafening silence when they ask a question or they ask them to work in this group and it's mass chaos. So I'm curious, you know, to me, it sounds like Game to Grow is sort of right in this mix where this is the world. <laughs> it comes with challenges and advantages. Are you seeing that or what? what is what are you seeing in terms of the challenges that young people are facing from a from a mental health challenge you know post pandemic i mean again i can't i mm. hesitate to say we we got like a triple demic now between rsv and the flu but assuming yeah. it's not as bad as it was like what what are you seeing in, in sort of the, especially globally right because you you're you now have a global footprint sure i don't to be fair i don't run all of our groups <laughs> um, yeah. we have a staff so we have 150 clients around the world i i i only see four of them so i can only speak to into the specific mm -hmm. four that I've, i i work with directly but i know that a lot of the the people who come to us it's it's a lot of anxiety a lot of depression it's a lot of the same kinds of things i think um one of the things that the pandemic really took from us was that sense of community it was it was the casual passing somebody in a hallway it was somebody who's not my closest friend, mm -hmm. but is someone who I like, right? There was this sort of barista class of friendship, right? <laughs> That's not somebody that I'm going to have over my house necessarily, but it's somebody who I enjoy seeing every couple of days when I go get a cup of coffee. I live in Seattle, so we do, right. you know, yeah, we of course. Do a lot, yeah. right? Um, but like that, that sort of uh, sphere of friendship and community, I think really atrophied during the pandemic, not just for adults, but for everybody, mm -hmm. because you weren't able to see anybody but the people you really chose to be with. Mm -hmm. So that kind of what, how do I make small talk? How do I navigate this kind of unstructured social space is really hard. Um, so I think one of the things that, that tabletop games are really good for in responding to that is, pr pr is providing some structure. So it's not just, two people finding a way to meet up and then finding something to talk about, right? Which can be <laughs> hard to do, especially if your social skills have atrophied over the last three years, right? Yep. So what tabletop gaming is really good for is providing a, a semi-structured social activity with opportunities for really structured encounters and then also a little bit of amorphous unstructured social play like the playground experience is kind of built into there too so you can do both of those things and a game master can kind of go back and forth and when it's getting a little too unstructured you can kind of put a little more structure back in and when the players are really ready you can kind of open it up again let them sandbox a little bit so that's been really really helpful i think the other thing that's really nice about tabletop games is that they're scheduled so there's a little sense of of agency and normalcy that can come from that. The other thing that I think the pandemic really took was any sense of control. Everything was changing all the time. Wear a mask, no, don't wear a mask. Now do this, now don't do that. Now you can maybe go out if, right? All of these messages were so conflicting at a time when I think a lot of us really were hoping for 
just go home and eat pasta for two weeks, right? We needed right. a little bit of predictability and a little bit of structure. So tabletop games totally provide that in a way that lets people really have a sense of agency. In the game, my character can do whatever I want them to do. I can really en engage in whatever. And, you know, there was a lot of boundary testing, right? A lot of kids who didn't feel like the world was a safe place because it largely wasn't, but also adults are now all freaking out too, right? right? So a lot of that sense of my structure is not here in so many ways that, that ability to, in a, in a tabletop role playing game, to test boundaries, to try things out, to kind of like, run amok a little bit, you know, to, to let the wild rumpus start with another group of, you know, <laughs> adolescents. Like, let's just get a little wild in here, but it's safe, but it's structured, but you have an adult there who says it's cool to go a little wild in this particular structured space, right? So I think that was all a really nice response to a lot of what the pandemic brought to our lives. And, you know, I mean, as you said, some of it, we're all experiencing this on some level, right? I mean, I think obviously kids are feeling it because they're at a pivotal moment in time. And certainly my guess, try and remember back as a kid, right? And your social group is probably of the, I want to say exaggerate, is more important because other things are tr you're exploring and learning. So it's, it's, it's tough. You know, I, but although I, I, sometimes you hear like, oh, they missed prom. You're like, did everybody miss prom or did the parents rant about prom? <laughs> like, there's a little bit of that too, where I'm like, oh, I'm not sure if everybody's way, especially again, being the kid that wasn't always included in things. Eh, I'm not sure that's the thing they missed. <laughs> the thing they worry about for me was much more the things we just mentioned, which was some of the basics that people are, it's to your point, sounds so anxious. They're unwilling to sort of almost do the basics for learning. Um, for engagement with each other or sort of look at each other like, you know, mildly horrified when you go, okay, work as a group. And they're like, what? No, <laughs> I don't even want to get well, close to you, much less work as a group. <laughs> being social, it's it's like any kind of, of exercise. Ex you're exercising a muscle. If you that muscle atrophies, it's hard to remember how to do it. It's kind of like riding a bike, but not really. It's actually much scarier um, to get back into being social. So a lot of people, especially if, if kids were put onto an electronic school, those schools weren't participatory. That was a lot of lecture. A lot of kids had their cameras off. They could, in many cases, release the clients we work with. They do other things yes. while the teacher is talking. I have, I have a lot of friends and colleagues who are teachers who said that it was excruciating being a being a teacher in that space because you couldn't engage your students in the ways that they wanted to so a lot it became a very passive education model it became very common because how do you manage small groups in a virtual space in the way that we could in a in an in-person space so i think given that there was all that time where they weren't given the ability to engage socially with with, that, with people who weren't their number one top choice of people. I think the other thing that, that is true for, for youth around this age is that they have, they have affinity groups, right? They, they are in a group of people who like this very specific thing that they like, right? I like Avatar The Last Airbender. I'm going to hang out with people who like Avatar. I want to talk about Minecraft. I want to talk to Minecraft people. Um, they're not engaging in that sort of broad social space yet until a little bit older where they have just a group of friends who like the same things as opposed to like really the, the affinity group model. So I think that the the other thing that's really hard is when there's not any any activity around the broadening of a social network that then all of a sudden they're pushed back in and expected to pretend like the last three years didn't happen. That's got to be really hard too. Absolutely. So you know, obviously you're using tabletop gaming therapeutically. Is there sort of a beginning and end point? Is there a launch now go, you know, how does that, how do you, how long is sort of that engagement? Um, is it bounded? Is it sort of constructed based on the group? What so, do you do? Uh, everybody comes to us for a different reason, right? So we have some, some young people come to us because they want to just dip their toe in and then they understand they, they learn a game, they build the community and now they can go to their friendly local game store. And that, that happens sometimes. We have some other people who come to us and I, I have a young person I'm working with now who I've worked with since they were 11 and they're now 17. Wow. And they played the same character the whole time. Right. And wow. that family, the family has been, uh, you know, has trusted me to be a, a role model in their child's life for the last 
six years playing <laughs> RPGs, right, as the way that I am that family's mentor. So I think that that the kind of social support one gets also evolves over time, right? Mm -hmm. As a, a really young person comes in, you know this, to play RPGs, it's a lot about like, how does the game work? Right. And what does it look to sit in a circle and engage in an activity, right? So like, that's kind of where we, we launch as, especially when they're 10, you know, ish years old. By the time someone's 17, I, I had a group um, where in the game I had turned everybody into werewolves. <laughs> there was sort of a <laughs> plot device where everybody became werewolves. And we ended up using the framework of your characters are werewolves as a way to understand mindfulness and understand how do we navigate complicated emotions? What is my anger trying to tell me? All of that was able to be inserted through the metaphor of I have this wolf inside me that that sometimes gets out of control, right? That was something that I would not have done with a 10 year old. Um, right. But because I had teenagers that I'd worked with for years who knew me, liked me, trusted me, we could engage in that level of work. So really it it depends on the age, it depends on the trust level that's been built and, and what the constituents are trying to get out of it. We actually have a, an adult program now. I don't, like I said, I don't run this one, but it's adults who are working on identity exploration, empathy building, um, empowerment, that they, they do that through uh, RPGs in a di very different way than a 10 year old comes to me because their parent wants to help support them and make friends. Um, I, I talked to a, a mom recently who um, was talking about their trajectory and they were kind of like, well, we knew our, our son wanted some, needed some more community, needed like an activity. So we were kind of thinking this was kind of like putting him in sports, but we knew he wasn't going to want to be in sports. So we, we put him here, yeah. but you know, we were kind of trying it out. And then they said that they they knew the value of what we were doing because their son went away to a sleepaway camp, which is already a big deal for this yeah, family. Sure. Mm -hmm. But then at sleepaway camp, the, the kid sent a picture back to mom of him sitting with all of his D&D books surrounded by people because <laughs> he was leading them through a game of D&D, right? Yeah. Like that yeah. is that is part of the magic of what we were doing is not only helping them build that social confidence, but also giving them a language and a community and, a, and an access point to have, you know, build that community. That's fantastic. And, and again, you know, I think in a lot of ways, probably for those people who grew up with gaming, some of that may have happened naturally, but to be able to apply it in a positive way in a structured way so that people actually do it intentionally and not because <laughs> that's the thing you had, um, right. I think is amazing. And, and again, you know, uh, we were the, the as we just said with the you know when 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 does gaming happen when you can't go anywhere and you have some free time? The new stage that's sort of interesting and you touched on this a little bit is adults who I think are suddenly find themselves saying, you know, I don't think I have a hobby anymore. Um, I'm astonished. I've, I've bummed to do a few. Frankly, people who you know sometimes you're like, I think you need a hobby, like, and not like you know a sarcastic <laughs> like you need a hobby, but like you need something that makes you happy. That's not tied to work. Um, and it is interesting because I think you're getting folks who probably got a lot. I Certainly, I'm that way. I got a lot from gaming. Um, and now you're an adult and you're like, oh, man, like, how do I get back to hang out with my peers <laughs> and doing that thing? So, you, I mean, you do offer it for adults, right? I mean, this is um, obviously a thing. Is there any differences or is, is it largely similar in terms of how you approach adults? The Well, the youth program we run is 90 minutes once a week. Mm -hmm. for 10 weeks so that's okay. you know 15 hours of engagement um the one of the, anybody who's played rpgs and has tried to schedule knows that scheduling is hard yeah um so adults have a really hard time with the schedule of 90 minutes once a week for 10 weeks the other thing about 90 minutes is it's perfect length of time for youth who are building that social endurance mm -hmm. but for adults 90 minutes is yeah, <laughs> not enough time to play, right? Um, so we have our, our adult program is three hours long. Right. And it's three sessions. So it ends up being slightly shorter, but it ends up being a, a deeper dive per session into how long. And, and the, the commitment of uh, 10 weeks is not there. So they can, it's committing to three, you know, three sessions of three hours, which is easier for a lot of adults, especially adults who are still trying to build that sort of social stamina work on the things that they're working on. That's a, a good level of engagement to have them come into. And we have, you know, like our 
you like our youth program, adults can still re-register and attend for, for session after session, but the commitment is a little bit lower when there's competing investments like family and work, et cetera, which the kids don't have yet. Right, right. No, that makes that, and it's interesting because I, I was curious about how you, but that totally, exactly. I mean, as soon as you said, I was like, all right, half, that's not, now you miss not enough, but that's why, because adults, like you said, kids are probably, that's plenty. They're probably tired by that, but adults for sure would need more. Um, I, I love that though, that, you know, obviously there's value in this for everybody from all walks of life. Um, you know, one of the things we see, look, I, I've been in corporate America for too long and, um, you know, resilience has become a buzzword. What's interesting though, and I've now finally seen this come to a head is sort of these businesses are saying, you know, we really want you to be resilient. And of course they're partially the reason people aren't, are under duress. <laughs> So you get into a weird space where you're like, yes, I think there's a place for resilience, but I'm not sure that you should be teaching resilience if you're <laughs> the one causing the problem. So, um, you know, I see Game to Grow as sort of that's that's the appropriate ethical moral approach, right? That's Those are the groups we want to teach us resilience. Um, and I imagine that's part of it. But are you seeing, and again, is this in a post-pandemic world, have we lost resilience, you think, or... What's changed sort of about, well, and, and, and because Game of Growth sort of came up during the pandemic, I guess it may be hard to say what was it before, but what have you seen as a difference in ter terms of approaching both mental health and gaming um, that's different now than it was before? Or is it the same? Is it the same challenges, just different problems? Um, you know, I'm not prepared to make an overarching statement about all of mental health challenges for, mm -hmm. for youth. Um, <laughs> I will say it's a lot of the same things. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it's it's developmentally in the kinds of uh, populations we work with, it's anxiety and depression. Yeah. Um, but anxiety and depression amidst the pandemic, when you don't have access to any opportunities to reduce that anxiety and depression, that's yeah, tough, right? right? And a lot of the populations that seek out Game to Grill are oftentimes populations that are treatment fatigued. They don't want to go talk to a therapist right. or they have talked to a therapist and therapists can be, you know, boring you right. know um and and the, the work that we do isn't technically capital t counseling right it's it's or capital t therapy right it's not it's not um we're not operating under a license we're a social support program we right. we support people to build their social confidence and help them flourish socially but we don't operate under that sort of capital t therapy so there's not the same sort of contract yeah. but it's a really valuable place there is a, another parent uh told us that coming to, to game to grow groups was like eating vegetables without knowing they were eating their vegetables <laughs> um and you know and there's this this sort of beautiful thing that we can do where the reality is is that kids don't know that they're getting something that's really really good for them because it feels like bubble gum but they're eating broccoli you know right. it, it's it's got a nice sort of mixture there um so I, I, to answer your question, I, I really couldn't tell you. I know that a, the sort of volume got turned up a little bit mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. the anxiety and depression. This is true for adults too. Like loneliness is a is a surging pandemic, and you've 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 got um, the additional layers of social media and the sort of you know attention economy all kind of needling away at our ability to be present with each other and connect as human beings. So all of that sort of compounding all together, where we've got parents who are also stressed out parents who are also navigating the complexities of the economy and the, you know, evolutions of the tridemic that you said, like you said earlier, yeah. right? Um, all of that, it just creates a, a, a system where it's difficult to be present and engaged and online with other people in a socially rewarding way. So it's, you know, I, I think that the, I think the issues are the same. I just think the volume is louder in a different circumstance. Absolutely. And I think that's fair. I think probably, to your point, some of the tools we had are probably not cutting it now, partially because the urgency and the anxiety and the, the, the sort of the stress has ratcheted up and partially because, um, you know, they may not work for this new world for lots of reasons, right? There's lots of things w that may not be working. I mean, we've seen certainly uh, to that point, you know, from a global perspective, a lot of these mental health organizations that offer counseling with a capital T. You know, they have to be licensed by country and t state. And then, you know, we I've actually reviewed some of those for corporate America and they've talked about how um, they can offer it worldwide. But it is it's naughty. Right. It's not a simple thing because there's all these licensing and rules and regulations and they're different by state, by the way. Um, <laughs> so it makes sense that sort of you're in this uh, somewhat gray space, which is a huge opportunity to be able to really bring to the table creativity and and also bring it everywhere, which is I think is fantastic. Um 
I do want to make sure I don't because we talked about this a little bit before we started. But uh, you, you it, in your bio, you mentioned the core gaming, and you said there's actually two different core gamings. So I'll leave it to you. Which core game would you like to talk about, or both? Because um, I'd love to hear more about that. Obviously, it's something that you are proud of. So tell us more. Sure. So the core just happens to be a great name that was used in two different <laughs> two different situations, and I didn't name either of those actually, so I can't mm -hmm. take credit for the fact that they're both called core. Um, the one you spoke to first was called Core Gaming, and that was a program that was actually created by a good friend and colleague of mine, Wilder Heath, at the Atlantic Street Center in South Seattle. And that was also paid for by a grant by uh, Child's Play. We brought computers into schools in South Seattle. This was all 2018, 2017, before the pandemic. And we would play video games with groups of middle schoolers and teach dialectical behavioral therapy skills and use the video games as a way to help them practice those skills. So I, like, we, we would play games like Overcooked, oh, which yep. is a cooperative game, but it's high stakes, requires <laughs> a lot of communication to be effective or lovers in a dangerous space time, similar thing, requires a lot of communication to be effective in the game. And then we made them all play silently. <laughs> and then just to really understand how how bad you could do if you didn't communicate. And then we let them communicate however they were going to communicate. And then we introduced some skills for how to communicate your wants and needs effectively. So wow. we had a whole framework around the interpersonal effectiveness triangle where we we understood that when in any kind of social inter interaction, you are you're you care about your objective, you care about your self-respect, and you care about your relationship. And we, we leveraged our whole 10-week program on that interpersonal effectiveness triangle, but now we're playing video games so how do you make sure your, your, your outcome is good, your score in the game or whatever? How do you make sure you communicate effectively to actually build the relationship? And how do you communicate effectively in a way that maintains your self-respect? Because whenever we play video games, sometimes we don't say the right thing, right? So there's a lot of a <laughs> lot of that. I've never experienced that ever. Right. I don't know what you're talking about, Adam. Yes, um, go ahead. Yep. <laughs> all of that was built in. So we, we were playing video games that they were like, I, I, we, one of the games we played was Nidhogg. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a game where you're a jouster and you are stabbing the other person and yellow goo comes out of them. It's like not a really particularly kid friendly, like <laughs> educational therapeutic game. Yeah. And I remember when I, I met the designer of that game at, at a convention once and I was like, I'm using your game to teach kids communication. And he went, what? Why? <laughs> so, so, there's a little little personal fun I had <laughs> using games that weren't, you know, like number munchers kind of style right. of educational games to help kids. Um, so that was the core gaming process program that one i believe it they're still doing it actually I, I left the atlantic street center to when we launched game to grow but i think that program is still active i think that curriculum is still being used out there in in school i'm not sure how they adapted to covid but i think that they're that's that's out there in the world now so i'm, I'm something i'm very proud of the um the the critical core which is the other core gaming um mm -hmm. <laughs> is um was actually a, a kickstarter game to grow launched in 2019 and that was really part of our, our mission, like I said, is to put a game in every school, a game in every hospital, a game in every clinic. And Critical Core is largely the vehicle for that. So Game to Grow, we, you know, we run our groups ourselves. We have a training program to help therapists, educators, and community members become better game masters. But we actually, Adam Johns and I were actually um, keynote presenters at the Washington Association of Marriage and Family Therapy talking about role-playing games and how important and useful they can be to help clients achieve outcomes. And we had all these therapists after this, after our presentation was over to say, I want to do that. How do I, who's never played tabletop role-playing games before, use it in my practice? Right. And at the time it was, well, I guess go to a game store and see if you can learn how to play the game and then buy the books and then, you know, Six months later, maybe when you feel competent to run a D and D game, run a D and D game. Cat alert! Yes, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> this is Freya the game cat. Yes, all right, that's all right. perfect. Yes, <laughs> so we we had all these all these therapists we knew, and this is not the first time that someone had reached out to us, right? We had we had therapists referring their clients to Game to Grow's groups who wanted to know more about how these games work, and the only solution we could find at the time was pick a game you want to learn, but you're going to learn it on your own pace and et cetera, et cetera. So what we did with Critical Core was what we really wanted to do was design a beginner's box for therapeutic role-playing games where it had a simplified rule set that was really designed for someone who's never really played RPGs before, be mm -hmm. it a facilitator or a player. And either way, the, the game is really 
stripped down. It's actually built with the open gaming license uh, from fifth edition, but it's really stripped down. It's like almost out of the box. You can play it. The um, other thing that we included in there is a, um, a facilitator's guide that has a lot of the kind of tips and tricks and table management strategies that we've built over a decade at Game to Grow. And then a, a story design, this is what I'm particularly proud of. The story design, our, our, our modules in the in the game kit actually use a, a story structure we call the dots system of narrative design. And every encounter in the game, every dot actually is aligned with our core capacities, which is our real world areas of social growth. So really a game master can pick up the box with the stories that we have built in there and then look at, oh, this encounter builds regulation skills, this encounter builds frustration tolerance, this encounter builds um, communication skills, et cetera. So we have a, a whole kit there that is a, the launch pad for getting more facilitators out there running games similar to Game of Grill. Yeah, and this, when I mentioned that, I was like, I think we covered, this is what we covered um, on N-World uh, was game the Game to Grow Critical Core. And look, <laughs> I'm going to say it was a success with the 3,000 <laughs> backers. And I don't know if I can see the goal, but it was 240,000. Uh, so look, there's obviously a need. I, it's funny because I feel like I've certainly had this conversation over and over, which is everybody sort of intuitively gets that this works. They know it works. This has to be one of the first times somebody has made it packageable and clearly a path so that other people can do it. So how is this doing in the wild? Now it's out, right? That this was, well, actually pretty recently. Um, uh, how, what's the feedback? Is there going to be more of that you think, or? <laughs> so it was a labor of love. Um, the, uh, when, when we launched that Kickstarter, it was actually an international conspiracy to help that launch that Kickstarter. We were actually reached out to by an ad agency in Hong Kong, uh, McGarry Bowen, who were the, the ones who originally had the idea for, for something to serve the autistic community in greater China. They connected with Virginia Spielman, who was in Hong Kong at the time, and, and she's a, a, a therapist who we sort of connected with over the internet, and then she reached out to us. So this was a Hong Kong, um, wow. Seattle, Washington conspiracy, as I like to call it. <laughs> um, and uh, so we got a lot of support launching that Kickstarter. Um, we were still, at that time, like a four-person company. It was really a big endeavor that we took on, and then the pandemic happened. Um, so we, the Kickstarter was successful. We were building it. And then Hong Kong was having the, the political crises that was happening there. Mm -hmm. We had our, our, the, you know, the nature of the world, uh, changed very much during the pandemic. We were shifting a lot of our priorities. All of that shifting online happened when we were in development of critical core. So we launched it later, like most Kickstarters, than we would have ideally uh, planned uh, to launch it, but it is now out. Um, it's available at criticalcore.org. We're, we're um, shipping all across the United States. Um, if you're in um, Canada or the United States, we can get it to you easily. If you're in Australia or China, I, I have a few copies that are there that I think I can get to you. So, um, right. but, but uh, it is for sale. And then if you are in uh, EU, UK, uh, it's on DriveThruRPG as well. So you can get it. Fantastic. Eventually. Yeah, because it's digital as well, right? It's a physical yes. and digital product. Yeah. So we'll one of the things CarPJ absolutely can do, which we have a sort of uh, gamers in need. I think I feel like this is something that we would want to make sure we we share and show how you know um, as a resource. So that's fantastic. I I'm thrilled that that did so well, um, and that it's it was a success. So um, you know I want to be sensitive to our time. You've got a lot going on. What are you doing next? Like, what what is next for for you and Game to Grow? I mean, look, I, I don't know. You've you've made sort of an industry standard. Uh, you know, you you went global when you probably weren't planning to. Um, you pretty much at this point, you know, you're working across borders and across countries. I'd say you've probably achieved some stuff that most people would be like, "Man, I'd be happy if a couple people showed up when I did something." So you're doing amazing. <laughs> but what's next? Um, so a, a couple of different, a couple of different programs Game to Grow has, um, we actually have a counseling program now. We, I said earlier that, that Game to Grow doesn't, our, our groups program is not technically counseling. We actually right. do have a counseling program at Game to Grow um, where we have licensed therapists in a handful of states that we can actually see clients in sort of gamer friendly therapy environments. So that's a, a new initiative where we just hired some new, new counselors who are all geeks and gamers themselves. So that's a cool new initiative going on at Game to Grow where they really, because they speak games and they sometimes will play games in their sessions, it's actually a really great opportunity to connect with adults who are in the gaming space. Since a lot of game designers, a lot of game, uh, you know, people in the in the electronic or, or tabletop gaming space 
Mm -hmm. don't have someone who understands and speaks their language when they go to a counselor. So one of the great things about Game to Grow's counseling program is that we can actually work with people in the games industry in a way that's that's um, really profound. As, a, as I've, in my trajectory in this space, I've met a lot of game designers and a lot of people in the gaming space who are like, man, I wish there was a groups program like that when I was a kid because right. now I'm still struggling with some of these things. And so the right. counseling program is a great way to reach out to them. Um, so that's one initiative that Game to Grow has going on right now that we haven't talked about yet. The other one that I'm really excited about, it's my new pet project is, because I need those. Um, <laughs> we, we started using uh, Critical Core in hospitals. Mm -hmm. So we've been, um, for the last year or so, we've been using, was another another adaptation in the virtual space is we had, you know, relationships, networking relationships with, with people who worked in hospitals. We were someday going to get into those hospitals in person, but there's so much red tape to get into hospitals in person, especially because there's hospitals all over the country. Right. Um, that once we went virtual, one of our good friends, Alexander, at the uh, Methodist Children's Hospital in San Antonio, Texas, we're like, we could still do this now without having to fly to San Antonio. Um, so we've been running games there virtually using Critical Core, entirely virtual. Kids can have a iPad on their hospital bed and play the game. Wow. Um, We've been doing that. We just expanded to Seattle Children's Hospital. I've been in talking to the CS Mott Children's Hospital in Ann Arbor, Michigan, as well as the uh, Texas Children's Hospital in Houston, Texas, which is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, children's hospital in the country. So we're really looking to build that program out and um, just got a grant to help support that program too. So we're, that's my new exciting place game to grow. Is oh, that is helping. exciting. So now, so, and what's the growth? The growth is multiple, is to expand other hospitals or what's the... What's the plan? That's, so th th that sort of depends. Um, right now, um, because it's been a pilot, it's been largely myself who's running those games. And so the next step will be bringing on probably our staff to co-run those games. And, and then we build out a best practices document and then we spread that around. And then we might be able to bring on more staff. There's also, the reality is there's a lot of gamers out there who really want to do this work and don't need to be paid for it. Right. They just want to help kids. And so we were exploring what it would look like to bring on sort of a like a semi volunteer kind of force. Yeah. An armada of of mm -hmm. people who want to be play games and give back. That's amazing. I this is this is fantastic. I mean holy cow. So I, it, I mean, phenomenal growth, phenomenal success. Um, I it, just absolutely fantastic. What can we, so certainly it sounds like one of the things we can do to support you. I mean, CarPJ is obviously an organization where we're very aligned with what you're doing. And as you, you've indicated earlier, you know, Hawk well, and certainly Hawk knows your work. Um, you know, we'll definitely help amplify critical core, but what else can we do to, to help? How else can we support you? This is the fundraising season. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. So we have mm -hmm. active fundraisers right now. If you go to gametogrow.org slash support, uh, you can see ways to make donations to our end of year campaign. So please do that. The work that we do is largely uh, grant and donation support. And so if you want to see more games and more hospitals, more games and more homes and more games and more, more clinics, um, you can make a donation to gametogrow.org slash support. Um, if you're Team Sprocket, because we got the Sprocket in our Game to Grow logo. So nice. Team Sprocket is the name of our streamer ambassador program. So you can learn more about that at gametogrow.org slash stream. Excellent. We have support slash stream. It's it's on the website. You can we'll find it. it. Don't worry. We're, we're we're all these as always, as I always say at the end, we'll make sure that we um we Great. uh we share all that information and everybody sees it. Um where else can, is there anywhere else where you haven't covered obviously the website where else can we find you besides that anything anywhere else so our website criticalcore.org game to grow.org for critical core and general game to grow work we're also on twitter facebook instagram all at game to grow fantastic easy to find i love that as we were saying not everybody is so this is good i mean look it goes hand in hand if you're going to be successful you have to be visible so uh, i think this is fantastic well Look, this is absolutely a pleasure. I'm thrilled um, to see this. I, I feel like everybody's trying to do this. I hope we can rally um, more folks who are certainly, like you said, there's got to be a, a significant contingent of ther therapeutic professionals and gamers. Um, and I hope we can continue to bring them, rally them under your banner, because I, I just think um, standardization is the key, right? Everything else, we, you know, we've got the will. There's nothing but goodwill from so many people who want to do it. It's putting them all in the right direction. 
And uh, right. it sounds like they've got the leaders that you know you you've got it. Um, so uh, super excited about this. Um, anything else that we missed or anything you wanted to share? That covers it. I think we we covered a lot of things today, so it feels great. No, fantastic. Well, I really appreciate your time. Stick around. I will stop the recording in a second. But thank you again. Uh, we will uh, put this both in our newsletter and in the YouTube channel. We'll make sure we get all the different links uh, and make sure that we can um, both support you and amplify your message because it's, it's absolutely the message that the Carpe endorses. So thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank that. you, Mike.